Hey guys, I hope you're all having a good day. We're going to cut the intro short because no one likes to listen to intros. In the edge of evolution, I consider the question of, well, how far into life does design extend? And the opposite way of looking at it is, how much can random changes plus selection really explain in life? Certainly can explain some things. Let's just for one second think about a hypothetical situation in which evolution cannot explain everything in terms of natural history. Let's say there are gaps, or so-called missing links. In reality, there really isn't, but for the sake of argument, let's pretend there is. In that case, why would you jump to the conclusion that there was any input of intelligent design? The honest position to take would be to first say we don't know, and then try to come up with hypotheses that fill in those gaps, and then we test those ideas until we reach a conclusion backed up by evidence. That's just how the scientific method works. In fact, that's how we got evolution in the first place. We didn't just think of it on the spot. It was over a century of hypothesizing, theorizing, testing, and observing. If there are some parts of natural history that cannot be explained by this robust theory, then we work using the same method to find out what could explain that. Jumping to a conclusion directly is not an honest position to take. It's not that there are only two possible explanations, evolution and creation. There are plenty of other explanations out there that could potentially explain where life came from and how it evolved. But everything requires evidence, including intelligent design. You don't get a free pass on this one. Um... And I argue that uh, from molecular biochemical considerations, I argued that design had to extend down to the level of biological class. And class is something like fish versus birds versus mammals and so on. Interesting. That's actually fairly different than what most creationists believe, it seems. And from what I've observed, intelligent design proponents often use the word kinds in an extremely vague fashion that has no value in scientific discussion. But Michael Behe here is a biochemist, so I'm not surprised he would use actual scientific terminology. Honestly, in my opinion, the taxonomical rank that fits most with kinds is probably family. I'm assuming this based on what Ray Comfort always says about the feline kind or the canine kind and so forth. Seems to be around the same area as what family describes. It's funny because creationists could have just used something like family instead of making up a word. They could have gotten a little bit more credibility that way. Not saying that's a lot. Anyway, Michael Behe here seems to believe that intelligent design affects to the degree of classes, which is much higher up in the classification system than family. An interesting claim that is much more generous to the side of evolution. I would love to hear him back up his claim nonetheless. And I thought there was good evidence that random changes plus selection could explain species, maybe genus, but in between that, in between class, there's order and uh, family and genus and so on. Uh, it, science simply hadn't progressed far enough uh, for, uh, for uh, a strong conclusion to be made. Hmm. So you're saying science can only explain species and maybe genus. That's actually more extreme than what most creationists believe. So what, there's just a gap in between? Intelligent design extends to classes and science goes up to genus and in between it's just whatever? What made you think that intelligent design explains down to classes to begin with? I mean, it just feels so random. If you personally think that science has its limitations set to genus, fine. I can see some creationists saying that, especially the ones that doubt, quote, macroevolution. But what makes you think intelligent design stops at classes? Originally, I thought you took that position because you thought evolution stopped at classes, so the rest must have been intelligent design. But now it's just completely random where you're setting these boundaries. Well, whatever. I would love to know your reasoning on why you doubt the process of evolution, but I also don't feel like reading your book either. I don't know who still reads books these days, <laughs> let's be honest. But that was 10 years ago, and uh, science has made a lot of progress, and it's, it's accelerating. No, you can't actually set a time frame in which science actually had its limitations set to genus, because that never existed. Evolution doesn't slowly climb up the classification system, it covers everything at once. And it turns out that I was right, that somewhere in that is the edge of evolution. But I think it's much deeper than the level of, of class. I think it actually goes down to the level of family, which is dogs versus cats and, and so on. Ah uh, yes, a lot of claims without going into details on why you believe those claims. I mean, I can't blame Behe here for not doing that since he is just going through a short interview. He does talk a little about irreducible complexity later on in the video, so we'll just have to wait for that. By the way, cats are better. So uh, if that's correct, 
then the information needed to specify a dog, a generic dog versus a generic cat, uh, had to have been intelligently arranged. Okay, so that actually wasn't what you originally said about intelligent design extending down to order. You said it turned out you were right, but that's actually not the case now, is it? You said order at first, now it's family. You said evolution explained a genus, now it's family. Ah, whatever. I'm going to skip to the part where you talk about irreducible complexity. My first book, um, Darwin's Black Box, I pointed out a problem that most everybody senses but really didn't have a term to it yet. It was actually suggested uh, by a man named St. George Mavart. And he says, well, you know, yeah, Darwin's idea of variation and selection, it'll work, but with things like the eye, the eye doesn't, can't see until it's got a number of parts with it. And I kind of extended the concept to a molecular level because molecular machinery needs a number of different parts to work too. And I coined a term irreducible complexity. And the term means that you've got a, uh, a machine or a system or something that has a number of parts and it needs all those parts to work. And if you take one away, the system can't work anymore. It can't be reduced. Yeah, so this guy is the main guy who stands behind the idea of irreducible complexity. And let me address that I argument first. I'm going to have to borrow and simplify an idea from Richard Dawkins here because I believe he explained it best. Basically, you can map out the evolution of an eye pretty easily because it went through various stages. First, you can just have a few receptors on some cells that can detect light. Any detection of light is beneficial because it can give you an idea of day and night. A photoreceptor can be relatively easy to create since all you need is some sort of conformational change upon the input of light radiation. Detection of such light is then passed down to future generations generations due to its usefulness and survival. Then it can start to slowly evolve to something more sophisticated. Say, the cells become a concave shape. That is more useful than just a flat surface because now you can detect where that light is coming from. Past that, you can then have lens-like membrane or tissues that help refract this light so that detection is easier and more clear. Then perhaps comes the development of different types of receptors that helps to see the colors. Again, this isn't difficult if you have receptors that change conformation upon certain wavelengths of visible light radiation. And that's pretty much it. It's now a functional eye. It's even more complete if you add a pinhole and add in some fluid, all of which is easy to do. Of course, this isn't as complex as human eyes, but it's an eye nonetheless, and small changes afterwards is what makes it better and better. But overall, you can see how the evolution of the eye would work. You don't need every functional part to have vision because the eye evolved slowly and had relatively more simplistic functions in the past. In fact, human eyes right now is still considered transitional. Everything is still transitional, because if humans continue to evolve, the eye will get better and gain more functions over time. It's not just limited to the eye either, and can apply to any organ or limb. Anyway, you can see varying degrees of the eye's function if you look at different species. Human eyes are quite advanced already. Many other organisms don't even have color detection. But the hawk, for example, has much better vision than we do. If you look at the gradient of various complexities of the eyes amongst animal species on Earth, you can really start to visualize how the development of the eye was a gradual process. Anyway, let's talk about cellular machinery next. And an example I used was a mouse trap, a mechanical mouse trap. And in most mechanical mousetraps, they've got a handful of different parts, and if you take away one or more, then it simply can't work. You take out the spring, it's broken. You remove the little hammer that hits the mouse, and it's broken too. I never liked that analogy. I think comparing a biochemical organelle to a piece of machinery that humans created is kind of stupid. But anyway, we'll just use the mousetrap for the sake of argument. Before this mousetrap evolved, its parts would have worked differently. Each component only has this unique function right now because it works together with the other parts. But before all of that, it would have been different. Of course, that depends on what organelle we are talking about. The parts could have still had relatively the same function, but formed a simpler structure, or that part could have had a different function. This is why I think for a discussion like this, using a mousetrap as an example isn't a good idea. If we talked about specific organelles, we could go into more detail on what these individual parts did if another part was missing. But anyway, Behe addresses one of the two points I just made, so let's hear what he has to say. Well, uh, Darwinists have, for the past 20 years or so, been trying to counter that argument, and they, they've offered a number of ar arguments, but in my completely unbiased opinion, they all fail. Well, your unbiased opinion seems to be wrong. The overwhelming majority of scientists don't agree with you, and it seems you lost some court cases or something because the judge ruled that the scientific consensus is clear on the matter of evolution and intelligent design. But let's hear your opinions anyway. And one, uh, one argument uh, is that, well, the uh, pieces of the mousetrap 
could be used for something else. So you don't have to have something that's working at a, as a mousetrap right away. Uh, you could use things for other purposes and then maybe they could come together. For example, one uh, scientist in a debate, he said, well, we can use a mousetrap without a, what's called a holding bar to keep the, keep the, uh, the uh, metal piece open. Uh, he said, I could use that as a tie clip. And he says, why, we could take the wooden base and we can use it as a paperweight. And that just really kind of distorts the argument. It's not that you can't use a, a piece of some complex machine as a paperweight. The irreducible complexity uh, concept says that if you take one away, you can't have a mousetrap anymore. You can't use that as a mousetrap it doesn't hold up because uh, in order to have parts that will later be put together into a mousetrap, you've got to have that future goal in mind. Okay, now you're thinking way too far about the mousetrap rather than cellular machinery. Yes, perhaps the parts that made up the structure didn't have the intention of making that structure at first. Their primary purpose would have been something else, perhaps something similar, or maybe even nothing at all. But assembly happens without any direction in place. There are many, many random structures that could form, but only the ones that benefit are there to stay, because of natural selection. Going back to the mousetrap, let's say the holding bar was originally used as a tie clip. This holding bar could then, for example, form together with other structures to form something else other than a mousetrap. It could also form the mousetrap, of course, and then you have millions of these little parts floating around that could always assemble to form something, anything. But only when the final structure has a beneficial function is it then there to stay. In this case, once the holding bar combines with the other components, it created a beneficial result, which is then passed down through evolution. And all of this is controlled by many factors including the individual's genetics and mutations. Cellular components can change its function in an instant if a mutation deems it so. And when you have a bunch of mutations causing the structural and functional changes of individual protein components, you can then spontaneously form a lot of different structures. That's why why irreducible complexity does not work as a valid argument. It misses an important process in evolution on how new, quote, mousetraps are formed. Whoa, would you look at the time. It's time to end this video. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you to Fireshard for your loyal support. I will see you in the next video.